Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome back for this uh, new seminar. Today, uh, we have the, the talk by Dr. Jennifer Donovan Mayer. She will talk okay. about good morning, everybody. Alma. Welcome back for this uh, new seminar. She will talk about ALMA, Planet Sensitivity Upgrades and Molecular Gas Imaging of a SID uh, equal 0.3 H1 detected galaxy. So uh, Jennifer will be properly introduced by Dr. Kelly Hess, who invited her. So Kelly, please. Thanks. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Donovan-Meyer, whom I've known since about probably 2012, I think, something like that. Um, Jen got her PhD at Columbia University in 2009, and then she did a, a postdoc at Stony Brook University uh, outside of New York, um, and then moved to the NRIO and the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in uh, 2013, where she started as a postdoc and then joined the scientific staff in 2015. Um, and she's been involved with various efforts at the NRIO and the North American ALMA Science Center, um, as well as the Joint ALMA Observatory. Uh, in particular, leading or serving as a subsystem scientist for distributed peer review, um, working with the CASA team as a validation lead and project scientist, among other roles. And uh, very recently, she joined the North American ALMA Development Program Science Team as the development scientist, where she's focusing on the upcoming um, wide gas city upgrade, which I think we'll hear about just now. So. Um, thanks. Take it away, John. Thanks, Kelly. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introductions and thanks for having me. Uh, I, it's it's been a really great visit. Uh, I've done almost nothing but science for three days. It's been really amazing. Um, so it's uh, this has just been such a nice uh, such a nice visit. It seems like a very um, a welcoming atmosphere. So thanks for hosting me. Um, so as uh, as has been mentioned already, my name is Jen. I'm a scientist at the NASC at, at NRAO. So that's the North American Alma Science Center. Uh, it's the, the regional arc we have in North America. Um, and I recently joined the development group, uh, working more directly with the ALMA development program about six or seven weeks ago. Uh, so my talk today is going to be in two parts. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce to you the ALMA wideband sensitivity upgrade, uh, which are some upgrades coming to ALMA largely by the end of this decade. Um, it's, it's very exciting, and I have to say um, it's happening much sooner um, than I even realized a couple of months ago before I joined the team. So I hope to share at least some of that excitement with you today. Um, and one thing I'd like to ask you to think about while I'm talking about it is, um, is basically what upgrades would help your science uh, with ALMA. And so if, if the upgrades that I talk about today are you know, going to enable some amazing science you haven't been able to do already, that's super. But if there are other things that we should be thinking about, I hope you'll grab me before I leave so that we can, um, so we can talk about that. Uh, the, uh, um, oh, and I should remind you, I'm, I'm still pretty new to this project, so I won't know the answers likely to all of your questions, um, but I'll do my best and hopefully give you some decent references to follow up. Um, and then I, I'd like to spend the last third or so of the talk uh, going over some of the things that Kelly and I've been working on this week. Uh, so these are um, some molecular gas observations with ALMA of a, what I'd like to call an intermediate redshift galaxy. Uh, so this presentation, at least the first parts, are based on some presentations that were given uh, by several folks in uh, at a, a meeting in the U.S. in January. And so thanks to them for, for sharing their slides, because a lot of this is coming from them. Okay, so um, just for, for some context first, uh, in 2018, after several years of investigation, the ALMA Development Working Group came up with a long-term development strategy for ALMA in the, the coming decade and beyond. Um, this was really going to prioritize pushing the boundaries of what the observatory can do uh, in, um, in three main science areas. Uh, so if you remember the original science drivers for ALMA, there was a very short list of goals that the observatory wanted to accomplish. Um, and so for this um, future, this vision of the future for ALMA, they've done the same thing. Um, and they've now defined three new um, science driving areas uh, that, um, that we're going to use to, to upgrade the observatory. Um, so these include the origins of galaxies. Uh, and so the origins of galaxies is really focused on um, the evolution of key tracers like O3 and C plus and CO and dust continuum, um, observing these basically from high redshift all the way through the peak of star formation at a redshift of two. Um, then there's the origins of chemical complexity. 
uh, which aims to trace the formation of these comms, their complex organic molecules, um, through the process of star and planet formation uh, at, at basically solar system scales um, and, uh, and be able to detect, um, uh, yeah, and be able to detect them um, at down at these, at these very, very small scales. Um, and finally, the origins of planets, which aims to image protoplanetary disks um, in nearby star forming regions, resolve their earth, earth forming zones, um, and then detect the, uh, the signs of planets like, uh, like tidal gaps and holes. Um, to achieve this new range of science, we basically cannot do that with current ALMA. Um, so let that sink in for a minute. Um, the current observatory isn't actually enough to reach the, the goals that have been laid out here. So um, the main conclusion of the roadmap is that the sensitivity of the observatory needs to be increased um, first with increased instantaneous bandwidth um, and then also with uh, generally more sensitive receivers. So the initial focus of the upgrades are on um, this wideband sensitivity upgrade or WSU, and that's what I'll talk about for the rest of this, this presentation. There we go. So what is the WSU? Uh, basically, this is a catch-all term that refers to the upgrades coming um, to the entire signal chain. And so I'm, I've put the whole signal chain over here kind of for reference, um, all the way from the receivers to the correlator. Uh, this is, um, this is the, the chain that all of your images that you know and love uh, begin with at the, at the observatory. Uh, the goal is to be finished by 2030, but there are some upgrades, like some of the receiver bands are going to come after that time. Uh, the highest priority items are a factor of two minimum and a, a factor of four is the stretch goal um, with an increase to the available bandwidth, um, as well as improved receiver temperatures and uh, revamp of, of the other signal chain pieces in between. Uh, the next generation correlator will be more sensitive. It's going to offer significantly more channels. Um, it will be able to correlate both arrays, the 12 meter and the seven meter arrays at the same time um, with independent observing. Um, and it'll all fit, fit within the space of a single quadrant. So that's one fourth of the current baseline correlator. Um, and for reference, that's a picture of the first quadrant of the baseline correlator that I'm showing in the slide. Um, it will be 20 years old in 2025, believe it or not. Um, and uh, thanks to advances in technology, the next generation correlator will fit entirely within that footprint. So to give you a sense of the scale of the WSU, uh, I've shown you a very cartoon version of the signal chain. So from, again, from antennas to correlator, um, everything that's in blue is going to be upgraded as part of the WSU. So um, most of the words on the slide are, um, are in blue. Uh, at the front end, this is where um, the receivers that are under the antennas receive your information. Um, or receive, receive the data when it first comes down. Um, then it goes through the back end uh, where it's uh, digitized. So the analog signal turns to digital. Um, then it, uh, the data is transferred to the array operations building, which is up there at the high site. Um, and then it travels through another fiber that will be replaced uh, to go down to the operations support facility at 3000 meters. Um, and uh, this is where the new correlator is going to be housed. Um, currently the correlator sits at the AOS, but the new one is going to be built at the OSF. Um, and then, of course, there are going to need to be upgrades down here to all of the offline um, subsystems, which are downstream of the correlator, but I'm not going to talk about those today. Okay, so uh, this is the, um, let's start with the status of each of these, um, each of these areas. The ALMA receivers are going to be upgraded in a staged rollout, so there'll be three, um, three stages of these upgrades. Um, in the first, uh, at last, we will see a brand new band two. Uh, and then um, uh, those are um, then the I'm sorry the first upgraded receiver is going to be band six which is uh, almost uh, basically most popular receiver it's the most published um, and the most requested uh, and so the new band six receiver will be called uh, band six version two or band six v two so that's how I'll refer to it in the rest of the um, this section uh, later in the decade we'll see uh, upgrades to bands eight. And then um, the second column here, band seven, nine, and 10. Um, and then in the next decade, we anticipate upgrades to the remaining bands. So let me tell you a little bit about these first upgrades, uh, just to give you a sense for what's coming, because it is coming soon. Um, band two has already had its critical design review. Um, so that's, that's this one over here. Uh, and it's going for manufacturing in the next couple of years. Uh, it will cover all the way from 67 to 116 gigahertz. So we're calling it um, band two, but it's actually going to cover the frequency range also of band three. So if you're a CO one to zero astronomer, um, the line that you know and love is this one right over here on the edge, um, but that will be in um, this upgraded band two. 
Um, and uh, the available instantaneous bandwidth is shown in the purple and yellow. So it's two tunings to cover the entire, this entire expanded band two. Um, band 6v2 is going to have some similar style upgrades. Uh, currently, you can see the coverage of band 6 in the red. Um, we're going to get a few more of those diagnostic lines and a slightly increased uh, footprint or spectral footprint of, of band 6 and band 6v2. Um, but really, the, uh, where you will see the increase in instantaneous bandwidth are these guys down here. Um, the red is showing you the current instantaneous bandwidth available with, uh, with band 6 in, in the red. Um, and then you can see how much larger the uh, the instantaneous bandwidth will be in the blue with band 6v2. Um, and just to remind you, even when the correlator can't access the entire width of a receiver's uh, you know spectral coverage, um, you can still tune windows simultaneously within the um, within the IFs to get access to all of your your favorite line combinations. Um, so here's the signal chain again. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to kind of skip over these um, these sections. Um, but there are uh, these are these are very critical upgrades as well, and, and actually quite a bit of progress has been made in the last year on them as well. Uh, so let me skip ahead to the correlator. This is the um, the new brain of Alma, or will be the new brain of Alma. This is the supercomputer that combines the individual signals from each of the antennas. Uh, it's a, the second generation correlator has a lot of names. Uh, it's called the Alma Talon Central Signal Processor, or AT.CSP, um, and it was just approved officially in November. Um, this is going to give us access initially to two times and eventually um, uh, expandable to four times the current instantaneous bandwidth of uh, the existing receivers. So we're going up to 16 to 32 gigahertz per polarization. Uh, there will be, as I mentioned, a vastly increased number of spectral channels available, 1.2 million um, if you want them, and flexible online channel averaging if you don't. Um, uh, I will be a channel averager myself. Um, the, the correlator, as I mentioned, will be flexible enough to process uh, independence 12 and 7 meter array observations at the same time, uh, and will use 6-bit correlation instead of 2. So this is significant because just by itself, that change leads to a 13.4% increase in sensitivity, which um, uh, compared to the, the current FDM mode of, of ALMA, um, it doesn't sound like much, but when you square that to get the relevant observing time, that alone, that change in the correlator is the equivalent of adding six more antennas, six more dishes um, to the array, six more 12 meter dishes. Um, and again, that's just from the correlator improvements by themselves. So um, for your total power data, there's also a new um, uh, the Atacama compact array spectrometer coming, um, and it will also be upgraded to match the new uh, channelization in the correlator. Uh, and so um, possibly you're thinking as you're hearing about all these things that there are definitely going to be some challenges ahead for the offline software. This is how are we going to handle all of this data coming from the from this upgraded observatory? And yes, you're right. Uh, but um, there are, uh, um, for the purposes of today, I'm not going to talk about those. Um, those changes, but there are working groups that are already studying the impact that these changes will have and what changes will need to come for the software as well. Um, so to try and drive home a little bit more um, just how much capability we're talking about here um, and what is summed up by these first two bullets, the um, this, this increase to the instantaneous bandwidth and, and 1.2 million spectral channels, um, I, I wanted to show a table, which I think does a nice job of sort of summing up what I'm talking about. So um, these are the 10 ALMA bands. Um, these are the, the uh, reference frequencies at the, um, at the centers of each of these bands. Uh, and then um, right now, the, the correlated bandwidth that's available with a baseline correlator is the second row right here. Um, and you'll see that with the, uh, the ALMA Talon central signal processor, um, each of those numbers goes up to 16. So um, this is uh, not only are, is the instantaneous bandwidth in each of these 10 ALMA bands increasing significantly and by factors, um, by factors that are shown here on the bottom row, uh, at the highest frequencies, this is a factor of four increase in, in correlated bandwidth, um, but at the lowest frequencies, it's, it's a factor of 68, um, which, is, which is quite a bit of increase. Um, but the, the, the change that's really relevant um, at the second bullet point is that the entire range of uh, of that correlated bandwidth will be accessible at very, very, very high spectral resolution. So um, that's, uh, that is the, uh, the kilometer per second equivalent of the spectral resolution that will be available across 16 gigahertz of bandwidth in each of these bands. Um, right now, if you wanted to do observations with ALMA that were at extremely high spectral resolution, you have to get these teeny tiny little FDM windows 
um, and and basically to cover an entire Alma receiver with these tiny windows is is not feasible um, unless you have you know a handful of large projects on top of each other. Um, and so with this um, with the with the upgraded correlator, those kinds of observations will basically become standard if if that's what your science requires. So um, so this is really exciting. This is has literally never um, never been accessible in the way that it will be. Um, so just to kind of summarize uh, what's coming with the WSU, uh, the WSU is going to benefit all observations. Um, the uh, Again, the instantaneous bandwidth, that's the sum of the upper and lower sidebands, is going up by a factor of at least two um, and a stretch goal to a factor of four. Uh, these are, again, like the yellow and purple bands that I was showing in the band two plot and, and the red and blue ones in the band 62 um, uh, coverage. But beyond that, the correlated bandwidth at high spectral resolution is just dramatically increased. Um, the requirement here is to return up to 0.1 kilometer per second resolution um, across 16 gigahertz per polarization of bandwidth. Um, and so if, you, um, if you're a person who usually uses lower spectral resolution, you'll just see the factor of two increase in your correlated bandwidth. But if you're a person who ever had to trade uh, you know, cor uh, correlated bandwidth for spectral resolution, say like you have to use those tiny windows right now, um, you're just going to see a tremendous increase in the amount of science you can do in a single observation. Uh, we're also, this is, um, you can, you could extrapolate this and see that we will dramatically increase the speed of spectral scans. So spectral scans is when you, um, when you take a, a tunings and you cover the entire width of a, of a receiver band. Um, these are really important for like chemical complexity studies and redshift searches at high, um, for high redshift lines where you don't really know the redshift very well. Um, so there'll be huge increases in the speeds of these scans because we can cover a receiver band in far fewer tunings. Um, for instance, it'll only take four tunings to cover the entirety of bands two and six, where right now this is practically impossible, um, especially at high resolution. Um, the other thing is that as a result of the channelization that will be in the new correlator, uh, the number of tunings you need at, at broad spectral resolution, like 10 kilometers per second for you know, nearby galaxies or something, is exactly the same number of tunings you would need to get 0.1 kilometer per second resolution. So you no longer have to make these choices um, that you've had to make uh, since, since ALMA was, was first created. Um, the spectral line imaging speeds are also going to go up um, from just the improvement in the receiver noise temperatures um, and the digital efficiency improvements that, um, that are coming as, as part of the, uh, the revamp of the signal chain. Um, and the continuum imaging speeds will go up by a factor of almost five um, from the, those effects as well as the correlated bandwidth increase. Um, and we'll also be able to provide for the very first time access to 10 kilometer or 10 meter per second. 10 meter per second frequencies at all ALMA frequencies for the very first time. Um, so that's a little bit of a niche science area, but if it applies to your science, it will be there as well. Um, I, um, I know there's a couple of VL, VLBI folks. I don't know if they're in the crowd here or if they're calling in online, but I, I, um, I do uh, had, did have a, one, a couple of things I wanted to say about that um, in case it applies. Uh, the, um, there are a couple of improvements that are coming with the WSU, um, including simultaneous coarse spectral resolution visibilities and the ability to observe with a single antenna in the array in VLBI mode without, without disturbing the rest of the array. Um, so these details and a whole bunch more are in this ALMA memo, um, which is posted to the archive. So um, if you have more questions that I haven't answered, I, I definitely recommend you go take a look at that one. Okay, so I wanted to spend a couple of minutes uh, translating these improvements into um, a few broad science cases. Uh, that are um, that are kind of bread and butter for Alma at the moment, uh, and then um, try and sort of translate those into the uh, this the new science themes that that are being focused on for the uh, for the Alma upgrade. So starting with the origin of planets, um, substructures that are detected around um, forming uh, that are uh, that are detected around even forming planets, so not just around forming stars, but also around forming planets. Um, are detectable even with current ALMA capabilities. Um, this is the first detection of a circumplanetary disk uh, around, um, as done with an ALMA band seven dust continuum observation. Um, uh, these can be attributed to uh, planets with Neptune masses or even super Earth masses. Um, ALMA is able to see these structures separated only by a few AU from the star. So, um, and then with, with longer baselines, we actually can push even further, um, even closer in. Uh, but this is um, this is actually a really critical science area that only ALMA is delivering. Um, even JWST will be sensitive to you know sub Jupiter mass planets. Uh, but those searches um, are, are limited to something like tens of AU. The, the star and planet separation has to be something like tens of AU at least. Um, so ALMA is really the, um, the, the way forward for these kinds of studies. Uh, so not just for direct detection. So here's that same, that's that same disk again, PDS-70C. 
Um, this brings me to the first improvement from the WSU, which is that two times continuum sensitivity. So for the same, um, just from the wider bandwidth, for the same observing time, you'd be able to reach the, uh, the same signal to noise, um, uh, or you'd reach the same sensitivity um, twice, uh, twice faster, but not just in that example, um, which is already you know, really impressive, but uh, a similar search for those kinds of structures in the, I believe this is MAPS, oh, I'm sorry, this is the D-sharp large program. Um, uh, they, were, uh, they did uh, a similar search for these kinds of circumplanetary disks. And they found a bunch of, they found a bunch of you know, blobs uh, at you know, something like three to five sigma, um, but you can see that there's a fair number of imaging artifacts in these images, um, and the, the detections are not as high signal to noise as you might want. Um, with uh, the same observing time with after the WSU, you know, these would be more like 10 or 11 sigma detections, the ones that hold up. Um, and uh, with the improvement in UV coverage that you get from the twice bandwidth, um, all of those artifacts are also going to be, um, are going to be improved. So if your continuum science is not in the low signal to noise regime instead, um, you'd actually then see a factor of five increase in your observing speed to reach the same sensitivity. Um, so that's easily translated into, you know, what would you do if you were five times faster? What other science could you do with that time? Um, five times as many targets or, you know, five times as many projects on the telescope for the community. Uh, it's, it's, it's easy, to, it's easy to, to think of what you would do instead. Um, so all my observations uh, of, of circumplanetary and, and uh, protoplanetary disks um, are not only done in the dust continuum, but they're also done in spectral lines. Uh, these images of disks around young stars give us a completely different and complementary view of the environments where planets are forming. Um, so these observations so, show some um, uh, apparently quite surprising structure on larger scales. Um, so here's a good example. You can see that way down in the middle of this, of this image where you see the dust continuum um, is actually surrounded in spectral line emission by, um, by these really big flocculent structures. Um, we can see spirals on kilo AU scales um, or streamers, and not just around the young, uh, the young stars. These are also sometimes around million-year-old systems, um, which is somewhat surprising, and that planet formation is, is still ongoing, possibly as a consequence of external perturbations. So it turns out there's really enormous variability in the structures around these planet-forming form systems. Um, so studying large samples becomes really critical to understanding um, how, how they're being formed. Unfortunately, um, disks have only been observed so far with either high spectral resolution um, or high sensitivity or in very large numbers. Um, it's been very difficult with the current observatory to do any combination of those three things um, just because they're very expensive uh, as far as time goes. Um, when you look even at the most recent ALMA large programs that are looking at these kinds of systems, um, and they have the ability to observe you know, quite a bit longer than a, than a regular program, even they are limited to something like sample sizes of 5 to 20. Um, so really not the kind of census that you'd be hoping to build um, at, at this stage. So these choices are really imposed by the limitations of the observatory and this trade-off um, in observing modes that have been possible. So the either wide bandwidth for continuum or really high spectral resolution for the lines. Um, and, and these uh, the, science, um, the science result of that is a biased chemical inventory of disks, uh, which after the WSU, hopefully we will not have to worry about anymore. Um, in fact, actually, if you look at the cycle eight proposals, so this is going back a couple of cycles, but um, if you look at the proposals that were submitted to ALMA, something like a third of them had to choose um, between resolution and sensitivity to, to continuum. Um, and if you only look at category three, which is where um, these kinds of studies uh, are, uh, are classified, um, that number goes up to 75%. So really this community is particularly hard hit by having to make this, this choice between your trade-off. Um, so again, the science requirement for the WSU is 0.1 kilometer per second resolution across 16 gigahertz per pole. Um, and uh, so hopefully those PIs will never, never again have to choose, um, make that difficult, that difficult choice. So um, now I'm using the MAPS large program as an example. Uh, and here, um, this is a look at the spectral coverage um, in band six uh, that they selected to do um, their, their spectral line imaging. Um, and so each of these highlighted uh, each of these highlighted lines um, and those teeny tiny, if you can even see them, these little skinny black, um, these little skinny black uh, bars here are showing you the spectral coverage of the individual spectral windows that they um, that they were able to design. So um, if we compare that now to what band six, um, the band six V2 correlator will give you, um, 
uh, or the increases in, in correlated bandwidth will give you. Um, and then here's the stretch goal uh, down here in orange. Um, you can start to see what I'm talking about, that how much more um, spectral grasp this, these kinds of projects will have once they're put on the telescope. Um, in fact, you could tune up to 80, 80 spectral windows in, um, in these bands right here. Um, so anyway, so this, uh, this increase uh, creates a huge increase in spectral grasp, which is the science you can get from a single observation in, um, uh, or a single tuning um, in both continuum and spectral line. Um, so this is pretty exciting. So, okay, so let's move uh, to an area where I'm a little more comfortable. Let's talk a little bit about some extragalactic examples. Um, this is another ALMA large program. This, these are images from the FANG survey. Um, it's a, um, a program that looked at the cold molecular gas in 90 uh, nearby massive spiral galaxies across the star planning main sequence. Uh, they were using a tracer of uh, CO2 to 1 to look at the molecular gas in these galaxies and understand, it, use it to understand the baryon cycle um, or the, the matter cycling between stars and gas in the ISM. Uh, they, um, uh, the uh, ALMA, of course, is, is uh, giving you access to the cold molecular gas um, in this case, uh, so the, the, um, the carbon monoxide emission that they were using to use that tracer. Uh, so FANGS finds uh, a number of things, uh, namely galaxy to galaxy variations in GMC properties um, that are mediated actually by local environments rather than, than kind of global environments. Um, so they, um, they, they found this, is, uh, uh, this variation from galaxy to galaxy is actually much more of a local effect rather than some global difference from one galaxy to another. Um, and they also found an interesting timescale effect uh, that they find GMCs are uh, giant molecular clouds uh, are rapidly destroyed after the onset of star formation. So um, that's even before you expect the, some of the supernovae to go off. Uh, and so all of this points to a need to better understand stellar feedback uh, and how those processes interact with the baryon cycle. Another recent ALMA project is the Alchemy project. Uh, this is uh, um, kind of on the other end of the, uh, of the way that projects were defined. The previous one was 90 spiral galaxies in a single line. And so um, Alchemy is one galaxy with, with many, many lines. Um, the, the galaxy is NGC 253. It's our nearest star, uh, central starburst. Um, so here I'm showing you the spectrum of this guy over five ALMA bands. Um, so a ton of lines that they um, that this group was able to use uh, to trace physical and chemical properties uh, in the in that starbursting region, and they find some really interesting things. They're able to constrain uh, the cosmic ray ionization rate uh, and also claim the first extragalactic phosphorus uh, bearing molecule detection. Um, so with ALMA 2030, we really have the opportunity to um, to uh, to go forward with these with these kinds of projects by combining this high spectral resolution and bandwidth. Um, such that existing surveys like FANGS, which are, you know, again, really broad, but only use a single line, um, or projects like Alchemy, which are, which are really deep, but only use a single target, um, uh, we, um, you know, we, we have to be able to combine these two together, because with a single line, um, you might be able to, to observe a lot of galaxies, but you can't constrain things like gas temperature or density or um, uh, gas excitation properties. Uh, which you can if you have a very deep line survey like like was done with alchemy, um, but we need to be able to sort of combine these into um, into into one goal to make progress. Um, we have to be able to go from a bulk gas tracer um, to to uh, observations that let you constrain the detailed physical properties of individual systems. Um, right now, this is very expensive. Uh, it's two hours on source for a single molecular cloud, um, but after the upgrade, it goes down to something like twenty or thirty minutes. Um, and now with FANGS, we know where something like 100,000 nearby giant molecular clouds are. Um, so after ALMA 2030, uh, there's, we actually really, I think, have the, the capability, um, as Eric says at the top of his slide, to go from a bulk gas tracer um, to an actual systematic physical and chemical um, probe of the extragalactic molecular cloud environments. Okay, um, so let's step out now further uh, than the local, uh, our local universe and, um, and go out uh, to some higher redshifts. Uh, here, the spectral lines in the infrared and the submillimeter are used to decode uh, galaxy evolution over um, basically over all of cosmic time. Um, the, um, these folks are generally looking at the growth of, of star forming regions and, um, and the growth of supermassive black holes. Uh, these are the, the two components that, that help galaxies grow. Um, and then they leave their inference on the gas and dust that they form out of and then kind of feed back into. So star forming regions and supermassive black holes are surrounded by a complex multi-phase uh, material um, gas and dust that uh, goes um, from cold molecular gas where the stars are actually forming um, and then into the ionized H2 regions that they create. 
So as those photons propagate outward, um, it creates this multi-phase layer with, um, with many tracers that we can then trace in the far infrared and submillimeter spectrum. Um, for uh, Similarly for black holes, there's also a number of lines that due to the higher ionization conditions and the warmer dust, um, there are some lines that also point very specifically to the presence of AGN. And so these are all, um, these are all color coded uh, uh, as to the, the process that they're tracing um, on the spectrum behind me. Uh, this is an IR spectrum of the Circinus galaxy. It's a, a nearby active galaxy showing, um, showing uh, both star formation and AGN activity. Um, the continuum emission, so you know this, this shape right here, this continuum emission is telling you about the warm and cold dust, um, and then all of these spectral lines are giving you the um, are giving you information about um, the processes that, that I was just describing. So how do we get to these lines? Um, Alma and JWST are our, our current best uh, our current best instruments to trace these lines. Um, this is uh, uh, these this is what the um, the spectrum would look like if we took Circinus and shifted it to a redshift of two. So now we're looking at what ALMA can trace um, for, a, for a source in this galaxy out at a redshift of two. And uh, uh, this is a really critical line. This is C plus. Uh, it's the dominant cooling line in, um, in galaxies. Uh, this is, uh, it, it exists in sort of the first layer of the photo dissociation region where massive stars basically heat up the gas and then it cools down so it can form stars again. Um, with the ALMA 2030 WSCU upgrades, um, the bandwidth and sensitivity will basically allow uh, an unbiased C plus survey um, at intermediate redshift, um, more or less uh, in a in a way that hasn't been done before, um, purely because we can look at larger samples uh, for a wider array of galaxies that aren't biased by existing redshift measurements. Um, and the reason that they can do that is again because of these spectral scans. Previously or or currently rather, um, you have to really distinctly know where you're looking for the line. Otherwise, you have a very you could have a very hard time kind of catching it. With, um, with the tunings that are available, but with these wider bandwidths, um, these surveys will become a lot less biased, um, which right now is really a limitation. Um, ALMA also gives you the dust sizes uh, from the millimeter continuum, um, and you can use that to measure the total dust mass of the um, emitting regions in intermediate redshift galaxies. So, um, so already with the WSU, you know, the, the gains are pretty clear. Um, increases in continuum sensitivity will give you better measurements of the dust from more galaxies. Um, and then the, the increases in spectral scanning ability will, um, will give you more access to these unbiased lines. So as we push to higher redshift at uh, redshift of six, the ALMA coverage um, shifts over here to the left and we start to recover more of these lines in the far infrared. Um, which is which is really exciting. Uh, for instance, there was a recent detection of a, at a redshift of nine uh, of O3. So this is, I believe, the current record holder for the highest redshift detection of uh, of gas in a galaxy. Um, so we can we could study individual galaxy spectra like the like the ones I've been describing, um, or we can stack them from large samples uh, to see how star formation and black holes grow um, and and evolve with redshift using the lines that directly trace those processes. So these are, um, this is sort of a summary of a couple of groups that are doing just this. Uh, the, um, these are a couple more ALMA programs called Alpine and Rebels. They're two surveys um, that are using galaxy samples selected in the ultraviolet uh, and following up with ALMA um, at these two redshift ranges. So at um, redshifts four to five, and then at redshifts around seven. Um, and they're using lines like the ones I was showing you on the previous slide. Um, so, with this, uh, these kinds of groups are working to constrain the evolution of the star formation density in the universe. And so that's what's shown here. This is this is redshift on the x-axis and the star formation rate density on the on the y. Um, and so you can see this kind of by now familiar peak of, uh, of, of star formation activity at around a redshift of two. Um, and so these groups are really pushing to see um, to, to observe these uh, these predictions um, out at, at higher redshift. So um, they're broadly trying to answer the question of, of why high Z uh, galaxies are either less dusty or are these, um, is the dust a different quantity? So that's why it's, it's not measured the same way with ALMA. Um, or is there just some selection effect at, at work here um, since these are all selected in the ultraviolet and ideally you'd, you know, you'd wanna make such a, um, a selection in say stellar mass or something instead. Um, the application of course to WSU is that because uh, these dust continuum measurements and, um, and spectral line uh, observations uh, will be more uh, sensitive after the WSU. A study like Rebels could be done in something like 21 hours instead of 70. Uh, so larger samples will help them, you know, take these error bars and, and really shrink them. So we learn more about what's happening at Z of 7. Um, this is the uh, one more result I wanted to show you at higher redshift. 
Uh, this is the, the source that I had mentioned before at redshift of nine. Um, the best detection of heavy metals, at least that, that I'm aware of, that's been made using ALMA. Um, again, they were using a spectral scan to, con uh, to confirm where the redshift was. And so this is what you have going in. Um, this is called a photometric redshift um, or the dropout method. So you basically take a bunch of uh, uh, optical and ultraviolet um, observations and you see the wavelength where the, where the galaxy disappears, where it drops out. Um, and then they go after that redshift um, and they try to confirm it with a, with a spectral line. Um, and so this group used four tunings uh, across the, this is the probability distribution of where they thought the redshift would be. Um, and so with four tunings, they were able to cover most of the um, of the area that they wanted to. It turns out the redshift was somewhere over here. So actually it was way out in the wings of their probability distribution, but they still got it um, at a redshift of 9.1. Um, with ALMA 2030, um, after the, the upgrades, uh, we'd be able to cover uh, this area in two tunings instead of four with sensitivity improvements uh, three times faster. So that's three times as many galaxies or um, uh, to, to help do some of these critical studies constraining uh, the redshifts uh, of many more dusty galaxies out to the epoch of reionization. Okay, so I'm um, kind of coming to the end of this, this uh, first half to two thirds of the talk. Um, I'm not gonna go through this whole table again because we've, we've been going and kind of beating you over the head with it as I've been going along, but, um, but here they are all again. Um, and then here again is the reference for uh, Alma Memo 621, which has a ton more details in it. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is that, uh, again, we want to have uh, as many, most of these upgrades will be in place by the end of the decade. Um, but uh, there, you know, again, there'll be a couple of receivers that come after that point. Um, but we are going to try to plan um, to, to keep the, the impact on science observing as minimal as possible, but there will be some impact for sure uh, as these, as the new, um, as the new correlator at least gets gets commissioned. Um, this is likely coming uh, in the like 2026 to 2028 period. Um, and then over the next year, uh, there will be a more detailed deployment and commissioning schedule that'll become available. Um, so stay tuned, but um, but yeah, anyway, this is this is this is coming and it's and it's pretty exciting. Uh, and I, I'd like to stop here for a minute and take any questions um, since the next half of the talk is very different. So let's uh, maybe if, if you have any questions, let's let's cover them now. Yeah. So a little bit about more about the how are you gonna how is this gonna affect the, the science time and everything? Yeah. I don't know how, how much planning is this already done for that, mm -hmm. but like uh do you know if they are gonna replace the receiver like little by little for one bin and then install the new correlator or like what's the do you have an idea? I, I, I sadly I don't. Um, the uh, I we're still kind of far enough away. Um, with it being in twenty twenty, you know, a, a start time in twenty twenty six, that I I don't have that kind of information. But certainly when they're installing new receivers now, um, I can I could say that they they basically pull the antennas out like a few at a time, and they'll they would install receivers and do you know, commission them, and then and then they they plunk them back okay. into the array. So um, right now the um, I think the number of antennas that is guaranteed for any single 12 meter observation is something like 48. So it does give us a little bit of leeway yeah, yeah. to pull a few at a time and and okay. and do these installations. For the correlator, it will be different. For the yeah, correlator, it will have to. Put it back in the arrays, yeah. we have like a mix of uh, receiver. I So for band two, um, I don't actually know where physically where it's gonna go, like on the receiver, like in the, in the, yeah. um, in the, like the cabin, um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I I can't imagine that there will be. I shouldn't say that because lots of things are imaginable. Um, uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't actually. I'm sorry. I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, hopefully within the next year when when we come out with more of a schedule, then then some of those things will become obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, so for instance, like uh, like the band one, which is coming halfway through um, this next cycle. Uh, it, I mean, it's, there's not going to be a massive observing stop to install all the band one receivers, right? So I, I think it's something that that they've actually gotten quite good at, sort of slipping them in and yeah, a little at a time. Yeah. yeah, it's not like we have to shut down for. And well, they do have a month of shutdown. And I think actually, when band one turns on, it's right after the February shutdown. So it could very well be that they're planning on doing a lot of that work, um, at least this time during like during February. In, in, I guess. Did you say that the band two will mm -hmm. cover the band three? Mm -hmm. So there's not going to be the 
So there will, so the, um, I've had this question before, and I, again, I also don't know the answer to this one, um, but the, you'll notice that that band three, the anticipated band three upgrade is one of the last ones. So this band two will go on, is one of the first things that's going to go on. That's, this is going to be imminent. Um, so if there will be a band three upgrade to just the band three portion of that new band two, um, it would have to be, I mean, it would have to represent a significant improvement over what we're delivering with this, with this one. So I don't know what it will look like at this, at this stage. I don't know what it will look like. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for the questions. Other questions? I guess to kind of follow on uh, something where they said, it, the, the upgrade where you're taking your uh, telescopes out, putting your receivers, putting them back on reminds me of the EBLA upgrade where yeah. there was a period of time where there was yeah. sort of like, they yeah. couldn't, really calibrate the non-EBLA and EBLA mm -hmm. kind of, are they um, thinking about that at all? So, I mean, the other thing that happened with that upgrade was they replaced the correlator. That's when they went from the old correlator to the wider correlator. Yeah. Um, and so I, this is, ugh, this is going back a little far for me. I was like at the start of my PhD when they did that. I can't remember if they just like straight up shut down for some time to turn it on or if they, if they did like if they, you know, like one was on during the day for testing and then the other was on at night. The, the thing with this correlator is it will be built in a completely different building, right? So um, the um, the old correlator is up at the, well, the old current correlator is up at the high site and the new one will be built at the OSF, um, which is which is helpful for a number of reasons. Um, but it's not like one has to, you know, physically be removed in order to put the other one in its place. They'll be in, they'll be in totally different buildings. So I, I would guess it's, you know, they, they will be doing a number of things that they can test before they actually, you know, turn one off completely and yeah, ship it away, whatever they're going to do with it. <laughs> uh, one last question before we move on. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, no, this is great. Thanks. Uh, like, yeah, so the, the goal of all of that is to get more sensitive yeah. for that. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so you're changing the receiver, changing it, the collector, all the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's more, it's cheaper than to add new antennas. Is it the, the reason? Uh, so I think this is, um, uh, I'm not going to answer the question of why they're doing this first, because I that is an answer I, um, it's, comes probably from several levels above me. Um, but as uh, this is this is where we're starting. But I, you know, adding antennas is another. Um, so in, in that in that link right there in the WSC white paper and in the roadmap that I mentioned at the beginning, um, certainly adding antennas and longer baselines. There's a number of upgrades that can be considered uh, to upgrade Alma into the next decade and beyond. Um, this is just where we're starting. So I, I think that's the right party line to give you. This is where we're starting. But um, but the others are not off the table. It's just that this is. This is what's coming first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just to give you a time check, we're about yeah. 45 minutes from okay. when we started. Sounds good. You took some questions. So, you know, we can, we'll shave those off the end. Perfect. Okay. So, um, I'm going to move on then to the second half of the talk, which is uh, I'm talking about um, the science project that I was here working this week uh, with, with Kelly on. Um, this part of the talk is a bit more informal uh, because a lot of the stuff that I'll show you, well, the things I'll show you at the very end, um, some of those plots were made like, you know, less than 48 hours ago. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see, you know, um, let's, let's see how it goes. <laughs> um, so uh, despite the amazing upgrades with Alma that I've just convinced you were going to, you know, obviously change your, your lives, um, science at lower frequencies has always been really um, close to my heart because we can use it to trace more and more directly something that I find really fascinating, which is how galaxies grow. Um, and so uh, galaxies are sometimes treated as these, these closed boxes where um, the baryons in them you know, are, are gas and they become stars and then the stars become gas and then they become stars again. Um, and there's all this recycling kind of between states. But when we compare observations of the highest redshift galaxies, so galaxies back at, at you know, um, at very, very, that redshift nine system, um, and we compare those to the ones we see now, um, galaxies have gone through a huge amount of transformation in that time, um, and they get a lot bigger. They have to grow somehow, and that matter has to come from somewhere. So cosmological simulations like these, um, uh, showing here the, the dark matter and, um, and the baryons in two separate images, um, are, are uh, these snapshots kind of give us a way to conceptualize 
um, how those how the the uh, these filaments might be feeding the halos that that then host galaxies these dark matter halos um, and uh, and then you know and then there's as well the not just the filaments that feed the halos but also the voids in between them where where um, you know at least comparatively a lot less is happening. Um, but baryons that trace this cosmic web, we can we can actually track with light, um, especially in these overdense regions um, like the one right at the center of the simulation, where um, you know galaxies or galaxy clusters are growing uh, hierarchically. So these simulations are giving you some expectations on very very large scales, a few hundred megaparsecs across. Uh, but observations on even the smallest and nearer scales can give us information about this this the ways that galaxies grow, um, and and how they build up their mass. So um, theories of hierarchical structure formation, so how, how galaxies grow by, small galaxies grow by, by adding other small things, and then you know, with those small things together, they become bigger things. Um, this is uh, not too similar from how, for instance, like the Magellanic Stream and the Magellanic Clouds are interacting with the Milky Way. Um, this is um, eventually, you know, eventually the molecular clouds, or sorry, the Magellanic Clouds are going to, um, are going to end up uh, impacting the, the Milky Way in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so this, uh, at the top here, I'm showing a, a model uh, that was made by Gertina Besla about uh, a decade ago, and it's now become kind of the standard picture for how the LMC and SMC are actually on their first approach to the Milky Way. Um, and the, they, they make this model based on the kinematics and the, the stellar um, uh, components of both the, the two molecular Find them like the, the two Magellanic clouds, the large and small Magellanic clouds, as well as the Magellanic stream, um, which is this huge H1 structure that, um, that both trails and leads um, the, the Magellanic systems. So um, dwarfs that fall into the Milky Way and what we can use them to learn about um, uh, at, at, for instance, high redshift have given studies like these the term uh, near field cosmology, um, which is really appropriate. Um, so galaxies can also grow by accreting gas straight from the intergalactic medium, or IGM. Um, this on the bottom is a beautiful map of a nearby galaxy called IC10. Uh, it's only about 700 kiloparsecs away from us. Um, on the left, this is low res. Or I'm sorry, this is high resolution uh, H1 imaging, and on the right, this is um, low resolution H1 imaging. Um, and both of them are color coded by the velocity of the the H1. Um, and so between the two of them, you can see that there's basically these. These two, um, these two streaming arms uh, where the gas uh, is, is basically falling into the center or being accreted onto the galaxy. Um, and those, um, those structures are not part of the general rotation of the galaxy itself. So um, this is ex excess gas that's coming in from someplace else um, and helping to feed the galaxy down at the center of, of its halo. So um, where the previous slide was showing you uh, very large scales, um, on uh, cosmological cosmological scales uh, at high redshift or intermediate redshift, and these are very nearby. Um, we can kind of ask how you know how do you get from one to the other? How did we get from from cosmology um, and our cosmic web images uh, to to z of zero? Um, so this is a similar plot to the one I showed a few slides ago. Um, whatever galaxies are doing to turn their gas into stars, they were doing it an awful lot at z of two and less of it now. Um, so that's kind of the long and short of it. Um, this is the this plot on the left is showing you the uh, the star formation rate uh, density as a function of redshift. And again, um, you know we have this peak between redshifts of two and three. Uh, here, the upper line is is corrected for UV extinction. So um, this is like a this is a dust corrected version, and then this is the luminosity density. So it's not corrected um, in in blue, um, and uh, it. Uh, both of these again um, uh, are peaking right around a redshift of two. Um, so if star formation is fueled by gas, uh, then um, like the IC10 example, uh, then you might assume that something changed about the gas supply um, into those star forming galaxy halos as a function of redshift. Um, but if you look at the right plot, somehow it did this without changing very much about what's going on with, this, with the H1. So um, omega H1 is giving you um, a, a uh, H1 density as a function of redshift. Um, these observations came from, I think they were Lyman Alpha, damp, or damp Lyman Alpha systems um, uh, from, from several years ago, studies out to, to higher redshift. Um, but while there's not much evolution in, in the H1, um, there is a significant amount of evolution, especially since they're redshift of one in uh, the molecular gas. And so that's what's being shown here in the gray um, and these two lines. So whatever has happened since redshift of one, and particularly since a redshift of about half, um, where these two really um, are, you know, are predicted to diverge, um, we, um, uh, we, we would really like to be able to trace that directly if possible. 
Uh, so um, if, in, for instance, it was possible to actually see what was happening with the molecular gas as a function of redshift, which, you know, with ALMA is something we can do with, um, with, with really great sensitivity and, and resolution, as I was showing before, um, with H1, that's actually been a lot harder up until recently, um, especially observing it directly in emission. Uh, but new technology on existing instruments and with some new instruments that are being built, uh, they're finally letting us see galaxies in this range uh, directly in emission. So observations of H1 beyond the local universe, um, pushing out beyond, say, a redshift of 0.2 um, has been very challenging uh, up until um, a, a kind of a, a, a recent few years ago. Uh, the, um, you'll notice, for instance, that how recent all of these, uh, how recent all of these, these references are, they're really all from the last several years. Um, and the, the, first, um, the first way to get around the difficulty in, in observing individual systems is to stack them, uh, stack the locations of galaxies in, um, uh, in their H1 lines. Uh, and so I am, uh, I'm showing a number of studies, particularly uh, these were all done at the GMRT uh, by, um, by recent groups uh, stacking galaxies in, in a variety of redshift bins. Um, and then um, and the, the stacks, you know, the stacks kind of look like this one, and then they divide by the number of galaxies and get a mean solar mass, uh, a mean H1 mass in solar masses for um, for all of their samples. Um, and so you can see, you know, as these as these get higher in in uh, redshift, uh, that that mean measure of the the H1 mass is actually increasing. Although you know, modulo whatever biases are in the the galaxy lists that they were stacking. Uh, another way that you can get H1 at higher redshift is through um, kind of nature's best uh, nature's best trick, which is gravitational lensing. Um, and so uh, this has been done by several groups over the last few years. The first one I could find is uh, is is by Andy Lipnicki. Um, he's a scientist at the NASC, uh, so I I love to highlight this. But um, they found a, a, a lensed H1 observation, or, uh, found a lensed spiral galaxy, and measured the H1 with three different telescopes to confirm its redshift at a fairly nearby 0.06. Um, and then there's a couple of other studies um, that are really pushing the envelope um, uh, to higher redshifts, uh, again, outside this, this uh, redshift of 0.2 or 0.1 or 0.2 um, uh, frontier, particularly the current record holder, which is this very recent detection uh, of a, uh, a lensed direct detection of H1 at a redshift of 1.3. So these stacks and, and these lensed uh, uh, observations are really helpful for putting statistics on some of the plots that I was just showing you, you know, kind of anchoring um, not only the Z of zero end, but, uh, you know, trying to anchor the, the um, higher and higher redshift ends of uh, what the H1 evolution is doing uh, over cosmic time. But if you actually wanted to see accretion, right, like the IC10 example, if you actually really want to see galaxies growing, um, what, do we, what do we need to be able to do that? Um, to be able to resolve individual galaxies with a sensitivity to image them, um, this brings me to a, a, a pro project called Chili's. Uh, this is a survey that I've been a part of for a number of years, and Kelly is as well. Um, the, uh, uh, by now, this is actually a, a fairly old slide, uh, but um, it, it's what I'm showing you is a 2D slice of, uh, of, of the sky, um, and, and these are all, uh, this is the, the galaxy environment um, as you look out through that slice. Um, so it goes out for a redshift of redshift of zero is down here at the um, kind of at the at the bottom. Um, and this reaches out to a redshift of 0.5. Uh, so previously, uh, direct observations of H1 in emission um, could be done, but they had to be done in fairly narrow redshift slices. So um, these are observations uh, as part of the Buddies project uh, from 2007. Um, and they looked at two uh, two very distinct redshift slices uh, out at a redshift around of around 0.2 um, to, to measure H1 in emission. Um, and then uh, just for reference, you know, kind of this gray area here are the observations that have basically been possible um, and, and fairly straightforward. Uh, these are, you know, say out to a redshift of 0.05 or so. Um, these are what's kind of generally covered by the, the all sky surveys. Um, uh, in, in H1 or blind all-sky surveys in H1 and um, can be followed up relatively straightforward with uh, with like the VLA or, or something. Um, so where Chili's is, is really making an impact uh, is first with the pilot uh, and then with the full survey um, is being able to simultaneously observe um, uh, an entire frequency range with a, with a massive number of spectral channels um, and a massive bandwidth. Uh, this, is a, this is a survey that's being done at the VLA. Um, the Cosmos H1 large EVLA survey. Uh, it's a it's a single beam pointing at the Cosmos field. 
uh, for a thousand hours. So the full survey, um, the full survey is a thousand hours, and that data has all been taken now. The collection is finally complete over five epochs. Oh, and I should mention that the resolution of chilies is um, is about five arc seconds at a redshift of zero. So these are all done in VRA. Okay, so um, just to give you an idea of the breadth of some of the, the science that's coming out of chilies, um, just from the first epoch of data, so from the first 178 hours, um, the survey power, the survey paper, and more work on the high Z side of the range is, is still in prep. Um, but the work that's been published already really shows you the capability of chilies. Uh, to use resolved detections of individual galaxies to look at the local and large scale environments and the effect that they have on individual galaxies directly. Um, so these are um, these are kind of like the uh, they're, they're letting you look at the, the environment of the galaxies, um, both like on the previous slide and then if you think back to the cosmic web images that I was showing at the beginning. Um, uh, it, it's it's putting galaxies more in those kinds of contexts. So uh, Kelly uh, actually led a paper on groups at two redshifts between a redshift of 0.1 and 0.2. Uh, and uh, the paper, among other things, showed uh, the very disturbed morphologies that some of these systems exhibit in H1, which is totally absent in the optical images. Um, uh, as often happens with observations of H1, um, you can trace the, the effects of interactions for a much longer time um, and out to a much larger distance than you can in the optical. And so um, here, for instance, you see two galaxies that are separated in velocity by only something like 400 kilometers a second, um, and uh, their morphologies are suggestive of a, of a past interaction. Uh, Nick, Nick Luber looked at some of the large scale structure in, in the cosmos field um, using 11,000, more than 11,000 spectroscopic redshifts and a code called disperse uh, to map out the, the actual filamentary structure that's present in the Chile's field as a function of redshift. Um, and he applied this to the 28 Chile de Chile's detections uh, from the first epoch. Uh, and then was able to compare the locations of those and the, the morphologies of those H1 detections to the, the filaments um, that they were among, uh, and finds actually that the, the separation from the cosmic web um, does depend, uh, or the, the, uh, the H1 properties do depend on the separation of those systems from um, the kind of nearest filament, the, the, um, the nearest cosmic web um, segment. So, uh, and that's H1 mass fraction. The H1 mass fraction increases as, as a function of separation. Um, Julia Bluebird uh, then had some further had a further study that was that's come out recently. Um, this is a this is actually the output of disperse. This is what disperse lets you do uh, is map out again that filamentary structure in uh, in the cosmos field. And so this is uh, this is looking only at the the sort of nearest uh, uh, fifth or so of the of the distance space. This goes out to a redshift of 0.1, um, and uh, the the purple is are showing you where the filaments are. Um, and then the pink uh, uh, boxes are where there are H1 detections that she considered for this uh, for this paper. Um, and here, one of the things she was looking at were the um, the uh, the galaxy spins. Uh, so one of the main results that come out of her paper was that the galaxy spins were actually aligned with the filaments. Um, they uh, 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 up to uh, there was a transition mass above which the um, the properties were a little bit different. Um, but basically, the overall um, the overall result was that the galaxy spins were aligned, uh, which is very interesting. So these studies are really letting us link uh, individual galaxy properties to this, this larger environment, the larger cosmic web. Um, there's also, I, I listed these references here in case you're curious. Um, I won't discuss them here, but um, Richard Dodson has a couple of papers on some of the imaging challenges and solutions that the group has found when it comes to imaging, um, which is, which is uh, not a straightforward endeavor. Um, however, maybe the best well-known uh, result from Chile's is the detection of Jimena Fernandez uh, in 2016, this was the highest redshift detection in that first 178 hour epoch. Uh, it's a, a galaxy at a redshift of 0.376. Um, and uh, on the, the left hand side here, I'm showing the H1 contours overlaid from Chile's uh, on an HST I band image. Um, and then here's Jimena's spectrum up here on the right hand side. Uh, and you can see um, there's some very nasty RFI uh, that, um, that exists immediately next to the galaxy. Um, so those those frequencies have just been have been blocked out. Um, you'll notice from the the H1 uh, uh, morphology that the emission is very asymmetric. Um, and if you just kind of squint, you can see there's a couple of fuzzy little uh, potential companion galaxies, or at least in projection. 
um, that are very nearby to this, this system. Um, and the H1, you know, very tantalizingly um, uh, covers them again in projection. Um, none of them have a confirmed spectroscopic redshift of which I'm aware, but this guy down here on the bottom um, does have a photo Z that puts it um, very close to the, the redshift of, of the main galaxy there. So um, that's a potentially interesting counterpart. Uh, to confirm, to confirm the redshift, uh, especially given the RFI uh, that was adjacent to the line, um, Jimena and the, the team did some further observations first with the LMT and then also with SOAR to get an optical spectrum. Um, and both of them came back with, uh, uh, so here with the LMT is a measurement of the CO1 to zero line. Um, and then with SOAR, uh, they used the optical, uh, the optical spectral lines to confirm the redshift and, and it came back precisely the same. So I think this is a this is a secure detection. So this is really exciting. Um, we now have the opportunity to understand an intermediate redshift galaxy, because um, for me, 0.4 is pretty close to intermediate. Um, uh, at an individual intermediate redshift system um, where we have a direct detection, not just of a stack, not just of a, you know, a spectrum, an unresolved spectrum, but an actual resolved map of the neutral hydrogen um, at, at a redshift of 0.4. Um, so one overarching question we've been kind of asking ourselves since then, um, is this thing a normal galaxy or is there something weird about it um, since it has all of this H1? Uh, well, so who is this? Who is this galaxy? Uh, it's a LERD, first of all. Um, and I have some of its properties uh, kind of summarized up here. It's it's sort of basic, uh, it's, it's basic properties. Uh, the star formation rate is largely obscured, which you can see from comparing um, the, the star formation rates that were calculated in, in three different ways. Um, since the UV is so low compared to the other two, it's, it's very likely um, that the star formation is, is largely obscured, especially since it's a LERG. Um, and uh, this star formation rate is actually typical of galaxies uh, closer to a redshift of one, um, as, as well as, as Eulers at redshift of zero. Um, so uh, to try and help kind of put this, this galaxy in context, um, Jimena included a couple of plots. Um, uh, these are among them in, in this paper. Uh, and here, uh, the, the filled circles and um, the field circles in each in each of these are showing you uh, like mergers and starbursts and lurgs, um, and all the crosses are the normal galaxies. So um, as you're looking, the um, you know up here where the blue box is, that's that's our galaxy. Um, you know it, it sort of consistently falls above the uh, what we would consider to be normal galaxies at a redshift of zero. Um, so the H1 mass is a few times ten to the ten, um, which is not an overwhelming H1 mass in and of itself, but it is really high. Um, for the stellar mass of the system, and that you can see here, um, it's well above what normal galaxies at redshift of zero look like. Um, this is this is H1 mass on the y and, and stellar mass here on the x-axis. Um, it's much more like uh, uh, the H1-rich systems that um, uh, that pop up out to a redshift of 0.2. Um, the CO luminosity, so this is coming from the um, the one to zero observations that the the group did with the LMT. Uh, can be converted to an H2 mass, depending on what you assume for a conversion factor, um, and that range is shown here. Uh, and so, um, and then uh, is put into context over here with a, a comparison to a bunch of different samples. Um, what's really important, I've tried to highlight, again, the normal galaxies are sort of down here at the bottom, um, big, bright, scary things at redshift of zero, we are kind of in the middle, and then star forming galaxies up around a redshift of one um, are, are really where our galaxy lives. So it looks much more like a star forming galaxy at a redshift of one um, than it does anything at redshift of zero. Uh, one thing I should note is that the, um, the red points that are being compared here are FIBS galaxies. Um, and again, the, the circles, the filled circles are the ones that are, are you know, mergers or, or lurgs or um, uh, uh, ULERGs, mergers or starbursts. Um, the, uh, these measurements were all done in CO3 to 2, so they had to be converted um, using sort of a standard uh, 3 to 2 to 1 to 0 conversion rate. Um, which uh, the number that was was used is a is a totally um, standard one right in the middle of the range that's usually assumed. Um, but if you assumed a, a kind of more aggressive uh, R three to one, which is more um, appropriate for like warmer gas, um, that actually drops these red points down, um, which would make our galaxy even you know even uh, even higher uh, or more more abnormal. Um, so now I want to get into the preliminary work that we were doing. Oh, this is hard to see. I apologize. Um, we're getting into some of the preliminary work that I've been doing. Um, basically, what we wanted to do is better understand the molecular gas content of this galaxy, again, to, to address whether or not this galaxy is normal or whether there is just something really special about this, um, this particular system. Um, and I'll go a little quickly through these, these last few slides because they're, um, yeah, they're, they're all uh, fairly recent. 
Um, but we, uh, so in addition to the previous LMT observations, which were done um, with an enormous beam, um, that's the beam of the LMT. Um, and this is, I apologize, I didn't realize how hard this was going to be to see, but the um, this little black circle here is showing you the ex optical extent from the HST image. Um, so the LMT, uh, not only does it include all the starlight, but actually that H1 emission is basically about this big. So um, the LMT beam is, is encompassing all of the, just about all of the H1 extent. Um, so we wanted to go back and follow up with a more resolved CO1 to zero, because with the LMT beam, we're not able to resolve, say, you know, is, is the, um, is that CO1 to zero all coming from our galaxy or is any of it coming from this, this system that it might be interacting with given the H1 morphology? Uh, and so we followed up with the GBT um, and the Argus beam is, uh, is much smaller. So this is one, um, that's the size of one CO1 to zero pointing. Um, and we did a mosaic of seven pointings um, that you can kind of see fill up this white circle. Um, and that circle was chosen or that, that spacing was chosen to approximate the ALMA primary beam that we can get with CO3 to two. So, um, so with this white beam, um, we now have some semi-resolved uh, CO1 to zero observations, as well as some very, very high resolution CO3 to two observations. Um, to kind of give you the, um, uh, the punchline, um, we did detect CO1 to zero very strongly in the middle. Um, and then in this pointing, the one to the Northeast. So the H1 goes this way, the CO1 to zero goes this way, um, uh, is, is brightest in the middle, but it, it does have an extension that way. Um, and then uh, let me show you what the three to two looks like. Um, so the three to two is really just covered um, way down here in the center. Uh, and so we, um, you know, hopefully you can see there are these two big, beautiful spiral arms uh, that come off that central bar, but the three to two is in none of it, uh, just about, it's all in the bar, it's all in the center. Um, so we were expecting a big dusty spiral galaxy, booming star formation all over the place, you know, because remember that H2 the, or the, the CO one to zero luminosity that Jimena plotted, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all in the middle. Um, it's all in the center. Um, and there, and then there's, there's, well, there's a little bit, there's might be a little bit down here in the bottom in the Southern arm um, that you can see in that moment zero map, but uh, it's, it's really largely all in the center. Um, so we go a little further and we stack the arms. Um, I stack them in five regions. Um, again, now we're getting into this is like this, this, these plots have not yet seen, you know, three mornings. So, so give them a, you know, give, give them, give them a, some space, but, um, you know, these are, this is the central spectrum, um, in CO3 to two. Now, these are my resolved, um, uh, three to two observations. Um, so the, the center is just really booming. Um, and then, you know, here we have these teeny tiny little, like maybe their detection. So I, I scaled the center way down so you could see them. Um, and uh, the south arm, yeah, I, I believe that. I think there's, I think there is emission there in the south arm that's that's uh, stacked up. And then there's a little bit over here um, in the north and the eastern arm. So over here, we get a little bit of three to two. Um, and remember, this is also spatially the direction where the one to zero went. So the one to zero went this way. Um, and that's where we see, you know, some, um, some narrow, uh, possible narrow stack detections of three to two. The other cool thing is that if you add the H1 to that spectrum, so ignore the one on the left for a minute, the H1 also goes to that side. So um, the three to two, you know, if we're, we're way down here in the weeds, um, we see these, these three to two uh, possible stacked uh, spectra over here. That's where the one to zero goes. And then um, the uh, in velocity, that's the side on the velocity where the H1 is. So anyway, so we're still figuring out what's going on here, um, but it's it's sort of a, a couple of surprises and we've got to fold them into one picture that makes sense. Um, one thing we have done already is uh, is take, so here I have all of the CO spectra on, um, now on the left-hand side, um, I have all the CO spectra on one, on one plot. Uh, the two single dish spectra, uh, the, um, the LMT is shown in blue. Um, so it, it's, you know, has like a, a, a hint that it might be on the wide side, um, even given it's, it's really broad spectral resolution. Um, and then the red one is the stack GBT. So that's all seven pointings with the GBT. Um, and they agree, you know, they agree fairly well. Uh, the GBT and the LMT, they're, they're both doing one to zero just over uh, different spatial scales. And, uh, and then here in black are my, is my three to two detection. If you scale that up with, an, with a Milky Way, just a regular Milky Way scaling, it looks just like the one to zero, which then makes the fact that this thing was so weird in CO really surprising. So anyway, so we're still, we're still figuring this out. Um, but I think there's, um, there's, something, there's something going on with this guy that, that I think is gonna be, anyway, uh, it, it's, this is, uh, it's a really interesting target to, um, to be investigating. So let me just put up some preliminary conclusions. 
Um, we do calculate an H2 mass from CO3 to 2 because we have it, so we do. Um, you have to observe, uh, you have to assume a conversion factor to go from CO to H2. And then because this is 3 to 2, you have to further assume a ratio of the 3 to 2 to 1 to 0. Um, so we used all of the sort of typical numbers um, for what that's worth. Uh, and then the, the number that you get when you when you fold in all of those typical numbers is a, is a few times 10 to the 10 solar masses of H2. Um, this is, uh, um, as I mentioned a, a little before, that that R3 to 1 um, is, is really something where I think we can push this a bit harder uh, just because the, you know, again, the, the higher that ratio is, if it's closer to 1, that, that indicates it's warmer gas. With all of this infrared emission, I, you know, I think we... Um, I think it's probably going to be more appropriate that we push that that factor in a, in a different direction. Um, if we had really resolved CO one to zero observations, then we could do this kind of you know in, in um, co-located spatial scales. But with the CO one to zero, we have it's you know it's uh, anyway. Um, we will um, we have to make some assumptions. Um, so then, despite being uh, strongest in the center and in the bar. Uh, the molecular gas is detectable in stacked spectra on the northeastern and southern arms, but but really the um, that the big detection was in the center. Um, we get no CO in the extended H1 or within the companion. Uh, the, um, the we don't we don't see it in the one to zero. Um, we don't see it in the three to two. But you'll notice from that slide I showed here, um, this little this arrow right here is showing you roughly where that that potential companion is. So it is on the edge of the primary beam. Um, for for the GVT and and the uh, um, and the ALMA observations, um, the AGN contribution. So we we went down this route for a while. Um, uh, the AGN contribution actually appears to be very low um, from some preliminary UV to far infrared modeling that we've done. Um, not yet folding in the the one millimeter continuum, but that's coming. Um, it does appear that the AGN co um, contribution is something like ten percent. Um, so if it's so this just very well could be a massive starburst, which which makes it similar um, to the samples that we've been studying at redshift of one. Um, so again, this is all really hand waving stuff at the moment. Um, there's more to come. Uh, we're, you know, we're obviously going to follow up on those LMT wings. And then I want to look also at the bar kinematics and see what those are, are feeding into the system. But um, yeah, I think that's all I'll say for now. I'll just I'll just go ahead and stop there. Any questions you have. Thanks. Cool. So, do we have any questions on the second part or or the first part? Or the first part. Read the first part. Yeah. Um, when you start this spectrum, the new slide there for this one, mm -hmm. there was a peak move to the right and then a peak down in the graph. You're talking about the H1 stacks? Yeah. This one. Oh. The H1 spectra on top of the CO. Oh, 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 oh. Um, this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so remember that there um oh actually that's sorry, that's on the other side. Uh that that horrible RFI section is where I just blanked it out to zero. Um yeah, yeah, there's uh there is some uh there is a, a big negative there. Uh the um what's the politically correct way to describe? The, <laughs> um, you <laughs> uh, so it's probably not absorption. It, it's it's probably not absorption. It's a uh, um, you know I've I've tried the um, the way that the H one cube it has been made that I'm working with now um, takes everything that Himena detected in the 2016 paper as as a, a prior. So um, we've made a number of cubes that have uh, they do an iterative. Um, smoothing and cleaning and subtracting with the continuum, um, but uh, the RFI environment in this, you know, in, in this area is um, is is challenging, and so it's not as clean as you might hope it would be. Um, so there are there are likely still some artifacts in the cubes that I've been working with, um, and I've tried to be um, rather than rather than uh, um, remaking the decision of whether or not the detection is is uh, is is a, a real one because that's that was the um, that was the result in the 2016 paper. We basically have gone, uh, or I, I basically am taking the the philosophy that the um, it it exists that the emission is real in the in the spectral channels where um, where it was first detected, 
So, um, so I've made some really narrow cuts, both spatially and in velocity, which may have actually exacerbated um, the appearance of some of that, the artifacts that you're seeing. And I think, so I think that's what that negative is. It's an artifact. Um, I don't think it's actual real absorption or anything like that. I, I think it's just an artifact. Why do you use carbon to see that? Because there's not a background continuum source that, um, that we would use to, um, that, that we would use to, to detect that. Yeah, um, the, uh, the, um, so the, to be able to get this spectrum in here, um, the continuum has already been carefully subtracted. And in fact, actually some of the artifact could be a slightly incorrect subtraction of that continuum that had more of an effect in these channels than you know, for, for, for in this particular cube. Um, there's about five cubes that I've been comparing. Um, and actually maybe something that would be good for me to do is see if that artifact is better or worse in some of the others. Um, they give a very consistent um, uh, result at the end. It just has to do with how much smoothing is done um, in the actual H1 channels itself before we before I go ahead and take the spectra. So um, I have plenty of, of plots of all five of them. Um, and this, this uh, feature is present in each of them, but because this, um, with in the higher smooth versions, it's a little bit shallower actually. Um, but then you, um, what you, what I really like about this one is you can still see two peaks in the in this particular H1 cube where once you get to more smoothing, you lose that. So, um, so I guess that's my trade off, right? I've I kept this one because I like I like being able to see the rotation. Um, but then to to do that, I had to you know I had to accept a little bit of yeah some more some more artifact in the in the adjacent channels. But yeah, uh, that's a good question. Thank you. Questions? Do you have the? Do you have any ambitions to go for higher uh, molecular transitions to, um, to the scales? I I think we I think we need to settle and <laughs> finish this one. Yeah. 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 Um, if there are no other questions, uh, I'm going to take Jen to talk to us, and whoever would like to come join us, um, please do. And uh, otherwise, I think we should thank her again. And that's it. Thanks, Thanks for coming.